Okay, but we're still polite. Um, all right, so welcome to this session. Um, where does marketing fit within the C-suite and the boardroom? And um, very grateful to have a panel here that all are members of the C-suite and all the boardroom. Uh, so starting with Julie Coleman, the Chief Research Officer of Cantor, uh, Seth Rogan, President and CEO of Nucleus Marketing, David Radford, uh, CMO from Allianz, and Peter Tufano, the Dean of the Business School and therefore our CEO, um, and a Professor of Finance. Uh, so I've also said the token finance person on this panel. Um, so I want to kick off with um, sort of initial question actually for, for Julie. Um, actually the question of the, the session title, where does this fit? Where does marketing fit within the C-suite and the boardroom in your experience? So I absolutely fundamentally believe that marketing is, is one of the most important um, members of the board, if not the most important member of the board, because mark the CMO, marketing is absolutely responsible for driving growth for the business. And businesses are in the business of creating growth and, driving and creating financial value. And the only way to do that is if you can convince more consumers or customers to buy your product or service. Or to, or to spend money on what you are offering to them. And so I think it, you know, the fact that marketing, that we're asking this question is slightly concerning because in today's world, growth is becoming harder and harder and harder to come by. It's not as easy as it was maybe 20, 25, 30 years ago. Um, so marketing, in my view, is even more important than ever because getting, finding customers and convincing them to, um, to spend money on what you have to offer is more difficult than it's ever been. So, so actually, let, let me, the fact it is, being asked is concerning is very true. And actually a piece of research um, paper published two months ago in September in the uh, Journal of Marketing, so one of the best academic journals in marketing, uh, actually one of the co-authors was my old PhD advisor. Um, they looked at 64,086 bios of directors of S&P 1500 firms. They found only 2%, 2.6% 2 uh, to be precise of uh, those board members had marketing expertise or marketing experience, 2.6%. So that might well be why we're asking that question. Seth, what, what's your take on that stat? That we're in trouble if we don't change things fast, right? I mean, I, I think that we first have to step back and think about how the role of the marketer has evolved. And if you went into marketing, let's say 15, 20 years ago, it was because you believed you could write a great creative line, you could understand some consumer strategy, and you worked your way up. And our business as marketers was a lot more about who you knew than about what you knew. It was a, a business that we could climb in. It was very limited in terms of the kinds of opportunity. And it was very limited in terms of the scope of the work. These days, a marketer, I, I, I think CMO is the hardest job in the industry. These days, a marketer has to be as much ahead of technology and understanding the future of data and tech. They have to be someone who understands the consumer journey. They have to understand how to fill that funnel at the top at all times because it's constantly draining. And at the same time, they fill an internal role. Really, the marketer is the soul of the company. And because they are the leader within the, uh, whatever the industry is to say, this is what our brand is, this is what every one of our employees stands for. And so to me, what that research says to me is something very big has to change. I think it is changing. I'd be interested to see that research two years from now. What, what do you think the number needs to be, David? Um, well, I'm not sure if the, whether it's that question, slightly sidestepping your challenge, <laughs> the, um, or how marketing orientated the whole company is. Because in a sense, if it's great if marketing is represented at, at the top level in an organization, but if the discipline is represented in that mindset of being orientated around the customer and the voice of the customer is embedded in strategic decision making, then um, if that's happening anyway, and marketing, the marketing function is able to affect that, then perhaps, perhaps the right outcome has been achieved. Um, personally, I think it should be a much higher percentage. And I'd be really interested to see how the performance of those organizations improves when you improve the degree of um, marketing leadership. Um, and the whole issue of whether marketers make a really good CEO, I think, is an interesting one to explore with the breadth of that perspective. So, Peter. So, if, if the boards aren't full of marketers, I wonder who they're full of. Um, what, what, what's your take on this? So, I sit on a few boards, so maybe I'll you know, kind of reflect on that as well as being you know, the dean here. And I want to put it in historical perspective. So, over the last 40 years, uh, if you think about it, 40 years ago, if you looked at boards, you found more marketers, I suspect. It's a guess. Um, but you know the dominant 
kind of narrative in boardrooms has been shareholder value maximization. And therefore, if that's your dominant mindset, then what you're going to do is you're going to make sure that your board represents that stakeholder. Um, and it's not a surprise that, you know, what the boards that I sit on, mostly it's lawyers and finance people, mm -hmm. right? Lawyers because of compliance and finance people because of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're moving back, and let's talk about where the pendulum is swinging, you know, back to kind of a central point, which is at the core of any great business is delivering great services and products to customers. And once you're at that point, then in fact, the marketers will become more important. And I think the pendulum is going to swing a little bit further. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit later, which is to think about the broader set of stakeholders beyond customers, financier, you know, investors, employees. And there, I suspect that there's an opportunity for either marketing strategy or some other function. And I have some thoughts about that to have a more dominant role in the conversation in the boardroom. I find it interesting. I find it interesting that um, there seems to be a disconnect between doing marketing well and driving growth for the company and better shareholder return. And that, I think, is what concerns me the most, is that if we don't believe that growing the business is what drives financial value and what drives shareholder return, then what do we believe drives it? So I think it's different for different firms. But what we've seen is there are some business models that think about efficiency as driving. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the consumer products space, I think we can come up with a couple of examples where, you know, severe efficiency gains, or however you want to call them, have been the model for growth. Not growth, but kind of uh, increased value. Um, but you're right. You know, the if it's not coming from satisfying customers, and therefore satisfying more customers, then you have to wonder about how sustainable that growth is, because you can't get costs down to zero. I actually think there's um, again difference between perception and reality here. Just uh, again that that study I mentioned. I mean, what they, they and I'm going to quote it because I thought it was a really uh, compelling uh, statement they made. They said the findings suggest common practice of not including experienced marketers on boards of directors puts firms at a competitive disadvantage, and they base that on actually looking at the presence or absence of experienced marketers, or marketing experience board members, MEBMs, um, uh, and looking at shareholder returns, looking at revenue growth, and they showed positive effects. So, so I think, uh, and it reminds me then of, uh, there's a piece in Ad Age last month um, that talked about, again, I'm going to quote this one, I jotted it down, some boards have simplistic views of marketing as the fluffy stuff. Um, David. <laughs> uh, yes, I guess. have to deal with that. I've certainly had to deal with that in the past. Um, I mean, I think there's an interesting balance, isn't there? I think the, uh, the, the marketer uh, to operate at senior level needs to embrace, you know, being the role of a director in the full sense and demonstrate uh, marketing as a means to an end to so those benefits to shareholders uh, or whatever the organisation's objectives are. Uh, and in that, I think marketing as a discipline arguably should concentrate a bit less on its own uh, level of self-confidence, if you like, and more on the outcomes it's, se it's seeking to drive. Uh, and in, I think um, stepping up to that level should really embrace the, uh, the end goals and objectives of, of the board or the executive team of the organization. So, um, so I think that's, th that's the first thing, to get, to get serious and take the, the role seriously. Um, at the same time, though, I think, I think there's an interesting balance because I think many traditional board structures are not always, uh, um, I might imagine, are not always... Um, uh, benefiting from a real diversity of thought and different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it might be the marketing function, it might be the marketer who brings in that uh, customer view that is perhaps a long way from uh, you know, the more traditional leaders of a business who developed up through seniority, etc., and can really uh, remind the business and act as, if you like, the conscience, the customer conscience of the business at that level, which I think is a you know, really valuable function. Uh, but yeah, certainly. I mean, there is the um, the element of marketing will now bring on the light entertainment uh, spot in the in the meeting, <laughs> and that's something to rail against, perhaps at times, to give there some um, some reassurance. Seth, do you have any thoughts to add to that? Well, be it light entertainment or otherwise. Um, I like to be pr the provider of the light entertainment. I I think that actually to come back to the way these two things connect, your previous question on this one, is we should look at the way people self-identify within their careers as well. My bet is that a lot of the people who answered that survey who said that there's only 2% marketers in the room do a lot of marketing work but don't own up to it because the perception 
amongst many legacy companies is that it is the fluffy light entertainment. I don't mean to point to you, David, when I say that. Um, <laughs> but there is that perception, and, and what has not evolved is the understanding of what the role means as the job has evolved. And that's why I think, uh, you know, to what Peter was saying, that it, the, the, it's going to swing, the pendulum will swing again. That sense of not wanting to self-identify as a marketer represents a lack of understanding of the power of the marketer. And if you look at the most successful, most cash-rich companies that own the market today, they are ones where the marketer has an extreme senior role. You look at uh, uh, Angela Arantz at Apple, who has transformed a business that no one even thought needed transforming and yet has catapulted that business. And the most successful ones have the strongest marketers either at the top or speaking to the top on a regular basis and really defining the culture, changing who the product is, changing uh, how the product is represented. Yeah, and I think it's, it's a marketing mindset as opposed to the job description per se, right? So thinking about the customer, caring about the customer, being that, that voice that, that David's talking about, um, but having that marketing sensibility as opposed to, oh yeah, I'm a marketer, I've always been a marketer, I've done these marketing jobs and now I've risen to the top. That might be part of the paradigm shift that we need. You know, so the metaphor of the pendulum, I wonder if it's not so much about, you know, pendulum swings from A to B and back again. Um, it needs to go to a different plane, perhaps. Uh, and, and part of that is this shift in mindset or recognizing that it doesn't necessarily matter what your, in some sense, functional expertise is. You need to care about the outside market. You need to care about growth, as Julie's been saying. You need to care about the customer because that's what is ultimately going to feel that growth. Um, so these are the things that these leaders need to be thinking about and members of boards need to think about, I think. Um, so I thought it might be a good time to see if anyone in the audience wants to ask us some questions or chime in on this, this debate because I'm sure there's uh, some opinions uh, in the room. We have some other people who also sit on boards and are... Um, you know, senior marketers uh, or executives. Um, but, you know, I'm definitely clear, uh, keen to hear audience views. Uh, please, and uh, say who you are and, and where you're from, please. Uh, my name is Valerie, and I'm in the MBA program. Um, you talked a little bit about how entire companies need to adopt a marketing mindset. And I was just wondering, do you think there's any particular mindsets that marketers need to adopt in order to succeed within the C-suite? Go ahead, David. I'm happy to say that, yes. Um, it definitely. I, I think one of the issues, I think two, two points really on that. One is um, one of level. So I think recognizing the strategic contribution of marketing and understanding that's possibly the thing that uh, at a senior decision making level people are interested in. And the tactics and other aspects of marketing that we all spend a lot of time worrying about are perhaps less relevant at that level. Mm -hmm. And I think the second thing is language. So I think the language that marketers need to use has to be, and I'd, I'd absolutely take Peter's point on this, I think it has to be the language of uh, the organization's key objectives. Uh, what are the shareholders interested in? What are the stakeholders of the organization interested in? And that's possibly not the, uh, the KPIs that marketers are looking at at a tactical level. So level, strategic, and language uh, that the, the CFO or the CEO is more interested in. Uh, and that would be the change I'd, I'd, I think that marketers should really embrace. Maybe I could just jump in. Um, you know, in a number of board exercises and top team exercises, often you go through this process and you try to get everybody to take their hats off before they come in the room, right? So you're not coming in as the marketing expert, not the operations expert, not the finance expert, but we're the senior team for the school, the organization, and I've just gone through a board exercise where we have different classes of board members and we've gone through exactly the same thing. And I think part of the problem, my small window into this, is that many people have a perspective on the customer. So in a boardroom, a lawyer will say, in the financial services industry, we have fiduciary responsibility to the customer. And it's definitely speaking to customer needs. And you know, in a financial service firm, a portfolio manager will say, I think what the, you know, the customer wants is this. That's the operations piece. Um, so part of it, I think, is that many people have legitimate points of view about what it takes to satisfy a customer, whether minimally in terms of legal requirements or maximally in terms of, of marketing. So to that extent, you know, we should all be a little bit of marketers. Having said that, you know, I think then it gets back to your point, David, which is how do you express marketing stuff to a broader audience? Um, if you ever looked at my CV, one of the crit critiques when I used to 
Bimar, a finance professor as opposed to dead weight, um, was that I did more marketing than I did finance. You know, why is it that consumers respond to performance data in the way that they do? Why is it that they buy certain kinds of financial products and not others? And that was a critique because, again, it was not seen as kind of core to finance about how it is that people bought products. So I think you need non-marketers to speak marketing lingo, or if not that, to at least be sensitive to the needs of customers. And then you need marketing people to, in the same way, to be able to understand, well, the value proposition here is great, but you know, the operations to produce that product are more complicated. And so, and it goes back to that taking your hat off when you go into the meeting. And I would also add to that, I think that um, a key role that the marketing that marketing can play is making sure that the organization is staying future focused. So not just maintaining our customer base today and making sure that that's growing, but what's next? We're taking that five to 10 year horizon and saying, what do we need to be preparing for because we believe this is coming down the road? And I think that's a really important role that marketing should be playing at the board level. Um, and it can demonstrate that they actually understand how to drive shareholder value um, for the organization and, and gain the respect that they need. Julie, I think you have it dead on and, and the, to me, the, the great divider between people who lead teams and people who lead entire organizations is the ability to stop complaining about the product you have and start creating strategy to market the product that you have, right? Because it's very easy to say, I wish my product also hovered in the air and spun, but not everyone's product is going to do that. So they say, well, I can't produce results if my product doesn't ho hover and spin. But the smartest marketers are able to look at the product they have and accentuate that, but do it in a way at the C level. Also that takes ownership to the earlier point of the financial needs of the company, because without that, no one's employed, right? And so it's a very rare person who can balance those things. And also because none of us are born at the C level, it takes a progression of time. And what I think the marketer brings is also the sense to what David was saying earlier of sort of customer agitator without being agitating <laughs> right, but to speak up for that voice because there is the temptation to always manage only the finance. And the marketer can often be, the, the other M it might be chief mission officer as well. Yeah, yeah just, just to add to that, and I, I think it's interesting that sometimes the marketer's perspective is a really useful one potentially for a CEO because there'll be questions that uh, the leader of the organization will be thinking about in terms of longer term, future, think to Julie's point, forward looking, uh, where do they get the kind of, um, if you like, the sort of main beam headlights for the car driving along at night? Where do you get that forward perspective from? And I think um, issues of brand, of culture, engaging people, these are all things that the, the marketing can contribute on. The challenge, I guess, is that as the, as the kind of breadth of the scope extends to almost justify having a marketer at the C-suite level, um, there is a risk that you lose sight of the core function of marketing of really creating distinctive products and services that, that you understand a customer is looking for or potentially could look for, uh, to your point. So I think there's a balance to be struck as well at that level. It reminds me of I was talking with the chairman of one of the largest retailers in the U.S. recently, and he asked his team of merchants why they hadn't sold more raincoats in the last year, and they reported back, it isn't raining as much. <laughs> And he said, for your, the salary of one CMO, I can afford three weathermen. <laughs> so it, it, it has to be someone who understands and is able to look beyond the, the actual and see the strategic. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it's, <clears throat> it, I like to talk in terms of disruptive growth and, and that these are um, people, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the marketer, but again, this, this sort of the person with the marketing mindset, the customer mindset in that group who is pushing that, that boundary, thinking ahead down the road, you know, not just what's in the headlights, but actually what the GPS is saying, because it's way, 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 way down the road. Um, and saying, well, we're gonna get disrupted, so instead I wanna be a force for positive disruption that's gonna drive that change so we're proactive. Uh, I think that's a way to get growth. Um, but, you know, I think these are, it's probably not one person. Right, so so you know the, the sort of the scope creep that that David you're talking about. That sounds like there should be a chief product officer as well as a chief marketing officer or a chief customer. I mean, but then we get into the thing and then we've got a chief of everything, and, and you know then there's chief growth and so on and so forth. So how do you, you know, straddle this? I'm sure Julie has a thought on this as well. Um, but but how do you deal with that? Because there's got to be some optimal point where there, it, it's not everything and so broad, but it's not so narrow that it's not you know, seeing anything beyond what's immediately in front. 
I think, I mean, sorry, I, I have to react to that because, <laughs> um, just possibly, um, because I, I think we're confusing the idea of what, you know, if, if we are talking about a chief marketing officer, and let's just use that phrase for now, I mean, if we believe that that, that is the person who's responsible for ensuring that the company can continue to grow, there are lots of different things that have to happen to make that happen. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean that the, C the chief marketing officer has to be the expert at doing all of those things. That chief marketing officer needs to orchestrate a team of people who can do those things. And I think, and, and I would not equate saying that the person who's responsible for the overall strategy for growth should be at the same level who is, the, who is responsible for delivering one pillar or one tactic to achieve that growth. And so that's why I would say you don't need a chief customer officer, you don't need a chief product officer. You, don't, you, need, the, you need to put the ownership and the accountability for growth in a place and then let him figure out how to orchestrate the team to deliver that. Him or her, sorry, um, to deliver that. How about some more audience questions? Please, go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Aman. I'm from the MBA program. So uh, I hear you got all of you talking about like how a marketing person is uh, someone who cares about the need of the customer. My take on it is slightly different. I think companies use their brand position to actually submit the customers to their will. And no offense to marketers in the room, and I am interested in marketing. But do, you think that marketing people. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think that could be the reason why uh, the, the numbers which you gave, right, 2%, is that's why people in the boardroom are actually scared to like associate themselves with marketing. Do we really need to change the narrative here? Because companies like Apple, right, they don't need to launch a phone which is 1,200 1, pounds, right? It, it is not 1,200 pounds, right? We know. So with the transparency of the information which is there nowadays and customers are getting smart, right, they know that what the company actually spent on making that phone and what is the markup they are charging. And it is not only for Apple, but so many other companies out there and what products they are selling to the customers. So maybe in front of the customers, like that evil, evil images coming out for, for marketing people, could be tech companies, could be pharmaceutical companies. So do you think we need to break position marketing in a different way, like change the narrative so that customers actually like trust marketing people and then like maybe marketing is incorporated into the C-suite and boardroom in a better manner? Yeah, I, th I think it's an interesting challenge. I mean, there, there is a school of thought that would say that um, the strength in the example you gave of Apple, of their brand and how that's able to command a premium, that's about more than just pure functionality. That's about a lot of the benefits, the emotional benefits you get from that brand. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it, I, you use the phrase submit to, to um, in your question, but, you know, no one's forcing you to buy an iPhone versus a, a Samsung, you know, similar phone or whatever. Um, but I think, you, I think you raise a really important point about, again, about the strategic level. So I am, le as a consumer, I am less suspicious of a brand's um, motives if I know why they are doing something and, and what the corporate... Um, reason for being is, if you like, behind that. And I think there is a role there for the marketer at senior level to try and influence that, to say this is part of our overall brand offering, that we signal to our consumers what we stand for and what we don't stand for, uh, what we're about and, our, and our, our, our reason for being, really. So I think the why behind that is important. And if you trust, uh, to your example, if you trust Apple's motives, then perhaps you're less, um, uh, you'd be, you know, we're less concerned about their pricing strategy. I can't comment on that. I don't know enough I about it. Back, sorry, I think that does get back to, um, you know, as you said, because part of that question was not, not being able to gain the respect that they need to gain in the, seat, in the boardroom. I think that goes back to the very original point, which is, you know, if a, if a CMO or the head of marketing, whatever they're called, goes into the boardroom and just shows the ads, why would you gain respect? If they come into the boardroom and they talk about, this is our strategy for how we're gonna drive growth, we're gonna better satisfy consumers' needs, we're gonna be able to do it at a price premium so that we become more profitable, then you have the respect that you're looking for. I think that's what's most important. So I just wanna pick up on this, and also Seth's chief mission officer, because I, and, I, and pick up your point. So back to the pendulum. So there is, at least at this school and some other places, this notion that the pendulum is swinging to a place where you know, greater corporate purpose will be, will be acknowledged. And whether it's environmental, cent you know, uh, environmental um, um, issues or you know, the, the full ESG spectrum. Um, as corporations move in that direction, growth will be still important, but other things will become equally important. Marketers tend to know a lot about customers. These other considerations are about non-customers. So the question is, who's gonna own that space? So in a boardroom, in a CEO suite, um, and we start to talk about, all right, we need to meet the needs, not only the people who buy our products and our regulators and our investors and our employees, 
but also all these poor consumers that are not really our cons customers but are affected by our products. That voice is not in the boardroom yet, other than through lawyers. Um, and how that voice comes in and whether marketing co-ops that voice because you're really good at knowing what people think. So to the extent that you knew about non-customers as well as you know about customers, I think you stand a better chance for that type of organization to have a bigger voice in important conversations. Are you sure you have something to say, Seth? Yeah, I mean, I keep wondering why it is that an industry based on being the most powerful storytellers on earth fails miserably at telling its own story. Right? We count on marketers to persuade the consumer to do everything from eat healthy to not so healthy, to, to travel, to consume, uh, for B2B to make a million or billion dollar decisions, and somehow marketers do the worst job of telling their own story. And that's where I think there's such a powerful opportunity in a discussion like this and in a program like this here, not to curry favor amongst my hosts, but w your, this industry needs to do a better job and it will not be the current generation that does it. It's going to be the generation that comes next that does a better job of telling the story of what marketing is because it will represent the idea of marketing as science and not just marketing as art. And it will represent marketing as strategic and mission-oriented and in understanding the power of persuasion but also the power of mission. All of those things that you're all studying, those who are the MBA students are, that's, to me that's what's so exciting about the fact that you're here because the industry has not done a great job. I sat at a table recently with uh, 10 C-level ad agency execs and asked them all, what's the one thing that keeps you up at night? Not a new question, but go with me. <laughs> and to a person, they all said talent. That the only thing they sell as ad agencies is the power of the human thought and the energy behind that because the technology can be purchased. But getting talented, smart people, is, that's everything they're looking for. And I think the only way we're going to grow as an industry is if the next generation does a better job of telling that story. And that's how everyone finds themselves in the C-suite, not 2%. How about some more questions? Over here, in the back, and then we'll come over here. All right. Hi, my name is Chi, um, also from the NBA. Um, so my question is um, with s something that the Dean mentioned earlier, which I think maybe if we understand that fundamentally, then it will help us to come up with a solution. So you mentioned that, okay, in the past, probably we had representatives in the C-suite and boardroom. Um, obviously, it's a guess, but you think that's what happened, right? So at what point do you think this switched you know, to what it is today? And if you can identify that period, what do you think could have driven that? You know? So I think I'm older than most people here. So I think I have the ability to answer this question through personal experience. Um, in the late 70s, uh, when I was getting out of college, going to financial services, going into advertising, becoming a brand manager at Procter Gamble were all equally important, valuable, and coveted positions. Right? I mean, I can assure you that in the mid to late 70s, you know, people died to be product managers at Procter & Gamble. In fact, you know, Steve Ballmer, you know, Microsoft, his first job with Jeff Immel was product manager at Procter & Gamble. Um, I've been at business schools for much of that time. Um, and what happened basically, um, and I think it's a combination of salaries and some other things, is that these days I think if I would poll our MBAs and say, how many of you want to be brand managers, how many of you want to go into advertising, and how many of you want to go into finance, um, those numbers have changed dramatically. I think it's in part compensation. Um, and I, I think we'd be naive to say that because you know, compensation differentials can be 10 times easily. Um, and in part, the narrative. You know, we're talking about the narrative, the story. Um, and we need to change that narrative in order to get people to find the things that they love doing uh, as opposed to the things that pay the most. So maybe that's a, kind of a, a mercantile answer, but I think there's some truth to it. I would, I would completely agree with that. And I would also say that I think there's also a perception of influence that comes with that. If you, you, know, if you get to a scene, and, and maybe it's a circular argument, but I think people tend to believe that if you go into a financial career, not only will you make more money, but you have the opportunity to influence more, and you have the opportunity to see more tangible results of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that's where um, marketing also suffers in terms of its narrative. 
I'd, I'd agree with that, but I, but I also think you know it's a great time. Oh, that's only very worthy. About it. it is a, it is a great time to to for marketers. If you look at the the changes in the environment that marketers today and, and looking forward is going to be operating in, um, that's a fantastic opportunity. Uh, there are some incredibly important causes and. Um, opportunities for marketers to make a difference in society that are not really commercial, that are not really driven purely by uh, the uh, the amount of salary the individual's going to get. And increasingly, I think a lot of, uh, it would be interesting to put it to the room actually, the increasing, a lot of people I think um, coming through business schools are looking for something more meaningful, more fulfilling, and more frankly more fun. And I think marketing needs to kind of uh, get back some of its mojo, if you like, and uh, be on the front foot. Now, it would be nice if there was a tenfold increase in salary, <laughs> but, yeah. but, um, but I d no, genuinely, I think it's a really exciting time for marketers, as, as in many respects, the, as I think Julie, the, the orchestrators, a whole range of other experts as, as a business moves forward, uh, because I'm not quite sure who else is going to do that. And as you say, there is a gap potentially for that role. Question in the back. Uh, yeah, I've, um, I've read, I'm not sure if this is true, that on the Amazon board, they have an empty seat, uh, which is the customer, and they leave it empty every time that they meet. Uh, I think that says something about marketing not being a department and being something that everyone on the board does. Like, How can marketing better influence the CFO, etc., to think more like a marketer and from the customer's perspective? What should we be doing? So less about us getting on boards and more about making the company more customer focused in totality? <laughs> um, I think part of it, I think part of it is, we talked about it earlier, is going back to the basics of reminding people of what drives, what drives the financial performance of the company. And what drives the financial performance of the company should be better satisfying customer needs, um, better s satisfying in such a way that we can be, we can premiumize or offer things at a more, you know, at a better price point. Um, and I think that I just really think that linkage has been lost in the day-to-day -day conversations that are happening at that level. It's become much more about cost engineering. It's become much more about, you know, should we buy back our shares? It's become, not that it shouldn't be those things, but it's not only those things. And I think that if we can reestablish that link, I think that would be critically important. I also think we're entering a time of renewed commoditization of products um, with the smart devices, uh, with voice ordering that we know is in early days but will come. And that is going to make the role of the marketer exponentially more important than it has ever been before. It should strike fear in every C-suite that has uh, a packaged good that can be ordered online. And anytime I have a mentor who taught me early on when you feel that fear, it, just know that it, it's a butterfly you're supposed to chase. And, and that is the moment that's in front of this whole industry right now is whether or not we can seize the opportunity because there will be brands that will wither and die because they do not brand correctly in what I call the shelfless society. That's what's coming next, right? I'm not gonna walk through the store. I'm going to uh, uh, be able to order everything from my home. I mean, you already can, but even more so as it becomes more and more ubiquitous and it becomes easier. And um, so there's an opportunity for the marketer to actually seize more of that customer voice and understand how it's going to evolve, but also to incent customer behavior in ways that have never been done before. No, ab absolutely. I mean, I'm just to your point, though, I also think there are, there, there are more ways available today to bring that voice of the customer physically into the meeting. And I, and I think it's something that if you take the, you know, the demands on, a, on a, I guess, a CFO or a CEO to actually regularly be in contact with the sharp end, with the customer, that's now possible through digital channels, even if it's not a physical experience in store or whatever. And equally, be in touch with the people in the business who, in turn, are closest to the customer. And, uh, you know, we all know the, um, the leaders of businesses who are inspiring because they have that immediacy, that relevance and connection to the customer. Uh, and that's something I think the marketers kind of, has to make sure that's happening. It's in their interest to make that happening, both for the orientation of the business, but also for their own kind of uh, ends in terms of getting uh, their own objectives across, which should be aligned. So I, I have a question for all of you. So over the last many decades, what we've seen is increasing power of the channel over the power of the product, right? Uh, channels have become more concentrated. Financial service channels, for sure, you know, buying channels. When channels become more concentrated, your direct link with the customer becomes attenuated. And the voice of the customer is harder to hear. And so, you know, to your point, how do you get the voice of the customer in the room when the distance between you and that customer is getting bigger, um, controlled by somebody else, um, and therefore, you know, how do you keep the voice of the customer in the empty seat? 
Well, that, it, that, is, that is absolutely the challenge and one that clearly we at Cantar are talking about on a fairly regular basis. Um, I, think, I think this is where, yes, I think the distance between, I think it's so many different things, but the, um, the distance between you and your customer because of, of the way the channels will start to work is going to become a problem. But I think that's also where we have to remember that um, in, in the old days, well, in, in a lot of industries, we weren't able to rely, we had never been able to rely on that direct link to the customer. If you sell soap, you've never had a direct link to the person that was buying your, your product. I think it's in this day and age where we, where so many industries have more of a link, we've forgotten that fact. So we knew how to market back then, so we just need to revive those principles and remember that if we start, if we just remember to talk to consumers and understand them as people and understand their needs and motivations rather than just relying on their purchase, purchase data, um, we can still win with them. We can still hear their voice. And you can do that through social media, for instance. Sometimes. Or customer insights, or all these other things. Seth? Yeah, I think it's about understanding the power of persuasion and that it changes over time. I don't think there was ever a steady state. I, I've been in the media business now, well, I won't say how many years, but there's never been concrete beneath my feet, right? And constantly the venue that, that has been changing from a print business to a digital business to a mobile business, to a tablet business, to something that's read online and audio, and, and that will continue to change. I'll be stunned if it doesn't. And the most important thing, and I think this is, affects those of us who are in the C-suite and looking to hire marketers, is that you're looking for someone, to Andrew's point, that doesn't just see around corners, but is creating the next one, right? And, and that ability to do that spin all those plates while also delivering a short-term result is key. Um, and, and when we're looking at the people who have those proficiencies, that's who's gonna create that, sort of that next wave of results that we need. So I think we had a question over here. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Saikat. I'm from the MBA 2018-19 cohort. And my question is, basically it's, it's, I'm thinking loud and I'm willing to have a point of view from your side. So. Today's learning is like I observe both plus and minuses within the system. And the plus is like we heard from uh, Mr. Berube, and uh, later we also heard from Dr. Ahmed, like we how firms, they shouldn't have a digitization strategy. Rather, they should focus on the trends in impact and in, in marketing and how power of data can actually drive that positive change. So that was the plus for me. On the other hand, interestingly, I was speaking to Ms. Coleman during the break that there are some firms who are still basing their marketing on traditional strategies like, you know, they are only basing it on words uh, from their customer's mouth, or they are not even on the e-commerce platform. So this is the other extreme that I have observed today. So now based on that, how, how difficult is it for a change leader in terms of a CMO who is in that boardroom to lead that transformation? And uh, to repeat your question, like keeping the voice of customer on that platform as a change uh, mechanism over there. Another option <laughs> than to drive that change. You know, so the business I represent represents firsthand, uh, objectively intended journalism. And when I first started out the business, I just thought I would go to talk to brands and ask them to support us because it's noble to support journalism. Well, <laughs> that doesn't work. So uh, I realized that nobody can deposit nobility in the bank, right? And that we need to have a better ROI model that happens to also be noble. And even if my mission is different, I have to understand my customer's mission first and and so i quite honestly if you don't think you can be that change agent this isn't the industry for you and it's the same thing i was thinking with the question that we had in the back earlier about when the pendulum will swing don't wait swing it uh nobody gave any of the people up here the opportunity they waited and it was just handed to them right so you've got to be the one who is the change agent um and if you think it's difficult you're absolutely right the, the easy answer is yes of course it's it's going to be a hard thing to do um, but I think a marketer these days who is more focused on the science of results has a more compelling offering and a more compelling way to change that mindset than any other marketers have ever had, at least not in modern times. So I think we've got time for one more question. Please. Hi, I'm Colin. I'm another MBA student here. Um, I was curious, when you were discussing sort of the uh, commoditization of products, um, the, the challenge now is that you only get so much time in front of a customer when you do get them, and we've heard about that all day. So I also hear the trends that Dr. Dufano was discussing with becoming more purpose-driven organizations. Do you see that being mutually exclusive when you get in front of a customer, um, the importance of quality of your product and then quality of your brand and valuing that chance that you get in front of them? Yeah, I, I absolutely don't see any... Uh, 
when social purpose works and works well for a brand is when it fundamentally supports what the brand wants to stand for, not just from a social perspective, but also as a brand. What its competitive difference is, what its competitive advantage is, what it does for the consumer. And it's, it's I mean, if, if you have a brand proposition that is something that's different from the social purpose you're espousing, it's gonna be too much of a disconnect for the, for the consumer and they're not gonna understand what you want. When they're intricately um, linked, then it is incredibly powerful. You'll capture their attention and you will become extremely memorable and you don't need a lot of time to, to establish your message. So that's, th and that's really difficult to do, but when it's done well and done right, it's brilliant. I would, I'm sorry, I'm jumping. I would uh, encourage you to look at the most winning advertising campaign of 2018 at the Can Lions, at the Pencil Awards, and it's probably something you haven't seen but it won three titanium lions. The odds, I believe, of winning a single can lion is 0.04% when you enter, and this place won three. It's the island nation of Palau. If you don't know the island nation of Palau, it's just south of the Philippines, and they had an environmental tourism ad campaign that has driven tourism, but also driven awareness of their environmental issues, and it ends with what's called the Pledge for Palau. By the way, the campaign was created by Havas in Australia. And uh, the campaign ends with that when you visit Palau, you actually get a stamp in your passport that you have to sign what's called the Pledge for Palau, saying I will not hurt the environment, I will pick up plastic if I drop it. I, I highly recommend you looking into it. First of all, it is a beautiful work of art as commerce. The campaign is magnificent, and it, to win both creative awards and business awards takes a lot in the same year. But the fact that it is the winningest uh, uh, advertising campaign of the entire year says what you're asking is exactly the right question. That the best brands, you never even, probably there are people here who never even heard of that country or maybe have in passing, and yet it's winning global awards. It says to me, you can establish a brand, in this case a tourism brand, an ecotourism brand, with a very simple message, which is for them it was come here, enjoy how beautiful it is, and, and don't hurt it while you're there. And it won awards throughout the planet. So, we're pretty much out of time, but I wanted to give the panelists uh, one last chance to to uh, share any closing thoughts. So perhaps we just go go along the panel, starting with Peter. Um, so first of all, I want to say thank you to our guests and to Andrew for the Future Marketing Initiative and this uh, Future Proofing Project and podcast. Uh, I think marketing is really important. Uh, and speaking for, as your dean for some of you who are students, <laughs> uh, you know it is one of the most important functions in business, but it. And has not, as you've heard, not necessarily gotten the attention it should have or the, the stature it should have. But you know, to hearken back to those last questions, to the extent that you want to make businesses act more responsibly, to be more purpose-led, then the marketing function probably is pretty critical to that because it's not likely going to come out of accounting or finance. <laughs> um, it may or may not come out of operations and, and there are ethical supply chains and other sorts of things. But the natural place where some of those ideas would come from, and certainly the narrative to support them would be out of marketing. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd echo that. I'd maybe qualify it slightly. And I think that social purpose could, could come from anywhere, mm -hmm. but I think arguably the, the market is probably, well, best placed to amplify that and, and really make it part of the culture of the organization and make sure to the points that have been made by the panel that it rings true right through your experience of the organization. I would absolutely endorse, though, the point that the time for that kind of initiative has is, is really come down, particularly linked to the environment. Uh, and I think so many organisations are, are, are recognising that. Uh, and that's a real opportunity for marketers to get, get involved in that. And ask the difficult questions. I, mean, I think one of the great roles of marketers at this level would be, uh, to where they can add value, is to ask those challenging questions. And I'm sure, uh, I suspect many CEOs would thank them for doing that. I always wonder what drives someone to be a marketer. There's no one here who, when they were five years old, dreamt while playing with bricks that they were going to be marketing products for their financial advancement. And yet something happened within all of our lives where we realized that we had this ability to be persuasive, to apply technology, to make the world better, all not just from a sense of mission, but also from a sense of your skills. So if what you care about is making companies uh, uh, be more mission oriented, then the marketer drives that. If what you care about is seeing financial growth, then marketing provides that. Marketing is the engine of change in every industry. And that's why I want to answer the question, where does marketing fit within the C-suite and the boardroom? Securely. It needs to be there in every single organization. And I think it's worthwhile for you to follow up a couple of years later on that study and see if that 2% hasn't become 20%, because I believe it will. 
I couldn't have said that any better, so I'm not sure I can add anything to that. I, that, I, that was pretty much what I was going to say. I will just close by saying, for me, I've, you know, I've been doing marketing for a 30 plus years, and I've never once regretted that decision. I've never once had a moment where I thought I wasn't doing something that was important for the corporation that I belong to. Um, I absolutely love it, and I think everyone can have an amazing, successful, and very fulfilling career in marketing. And on that note, thank you, panel. Thank you, audience.